There has been many big controversies in F1 history, but given that Bernie Eccleston ran it for so long, that should come as no surprise to anyone. The sport itself was basically a controversy for 40 years. But there's one season that really takes the cake when it comes to controversy and makes 2021 look like a children's TV show. That season was, of course, 1994, a year that had so much controversy I would imagine even some big fans of the sport have probably long forgotten parts of it. And it's time to cover it all in this installment of Colouring Between the Lions, F1 Controversies Uncoloured on Earth. On... Roll VT! So going into the 1994 season, there had been some changes to the regulations that more or less set up the year for chaos. You see, the cars were getting incredibly fast to the point of dangerous. And on top of that, the driver aids on the cars had also gotten to the point where driver skill was becoming less important. And the FIA and F1 themselves decided that they wanted to put more of an emphasis on driver skill than on the technology. And this meant that all driver aids were banned for the 1994 season. Innovations such as active suspension, which Williams had perfected after Lotus tried it out in the late 80s, traction control, launch control, four-wheel steering, and automatic gearboxes were banned. Semi-automatic gearboxes would continue, but fully automatic gearboxes were no longer allowed. And in fact, they went as far as to set gear ratios of between four and seven for the teams, likely for performance regulation, of course, but also as well to stop the spiraling costs of these innovations that were hurting some of the teams further down the grid. And on top of this, they crucially also brought back refueling. For the first time since 1983, the teams would be able to run a race on whatever fuel load they wanted and refuel throughout the race, which would add a crucial strategic element to races and allow for the teams to try on light fuel for a stint and then heavy fuel for a stint and so on. And this was really important for a couple of reasons, one of which was mainly to do with Ferrari, who had decided to continue running V12s, which were thirsty while other teams had ran V8s and V10s. Most teams had settled on the V10 because it had the performance of a V12 with the thirstiness closer to a V8. However, that year, for example, Ferrari ran a V12 and Benetton with their Ford engine ran a V8, Williams running a V10. So there was a disparity between them and refueling would add something to the mix that would allow all the teams with their different engines to play with strategy. It was looking to be a good season with an emphasis on driver skill, lower costs for some of the smaller teams, and an added dynamic of strategy. But all of this would play into some silly fun and games. One of the key ingredients that would cause such a nightmare throughout the season was the lateness in which they had decided to remove the driver aids. Max Mosley, the new FIA president in the previous season in 1993, had decided on this with his team, but only announced it during the Canadian Grand Prix at race six, at which point the teams had already been developing their 1994 cars. And this caused concern in the paddock, because you see the FW15C as the prime example from 1993 was the most advanced Formula One car ever seen. In fact, because of those driver aids, it's still in many ways more advanced than the cars we have today. And they were ridiculously fast for the era. And that was going to be a problem. Senna himself foreshadowed hard when he said that you were going to cause accidents by taking driver aids off of cars that had already been designed to have driver aids. This meant you had the mixture of ridiculously fast cars with no aids to make sure that they didn't spin out in a corner. And this was at a very different time in F1's history when, let's remember, the safety was nowhere near what it is today. And in fact, it was this season that caused a lot of safety implementations to be created. 
that late announcement from Mosley meant that most of the teams decided to continue developing their 1994 cars with the plans they had started with, but just disable those driver aids as opposed to completely remove them, which would have been costly and time consuming in terms of code. Remember, this is 1994. To internet was still brand new. In the run-up to the opening Grand Prix at Brazil, in reality, the focus was not on Benetton or Schumacher, who would later become the focus, or Senna, who would obviously be a big part of this year's story, but instead on Ferrari. You see, Ferrari had got a brand new suspension that a lot of teams looked at with a bit of criticism, and Ferrari were worried about losing their suspension. They thought that if they came in to race one with a blazingly fast car, it would start to turn into a discussion about the legality around this innovative suspension that they had come up with. But like many times in Formula One history, when the on-track performance isn't a cause for concern, people lose interest quickly. And with Benetton and Schumacher's performance at race one, it was quickly forgotten. The Brazilian Grand Prix immediately made other teams, especially Senna and Williams, start to question the things around Benetton. Of course, there was Verstappen's crash, which is one of the most memorable moments of that Grand Prix. But more importantly for this story, when Senna came in to pit, he was seven seconds ahead of Schumacher. And Schumacher entered the pits behind him and managed to come out ahead. How he was able to pit from such a distance behind Senna and come out of the pits ahead started Senna and Williams wondering about how they were able to fuel the car so quickly. Perhaps it was the V8 compared to V10, but that shouldn't have made that big of a difference in the amount of fuel you would need to get to the end. Senna began to then hunt down Schumacher, who had built up a 10 second lead and got that down to five seconds before spinning out and ending his race. Schumacher and Benetton ended on the podium and suspicions began to be raised. At the next race at Japan, Senna stood at the sidelines watching Schumacher in practice to see if he could gain anything from this performance. And he began to suspect, given the performance of Schumacher's car, that Benetton were still illegally running traction control. He deduced this because of the fact that Schumacher was able to take the corners in a certain way and also how Schumacher's car sounded coming around the corners. And there were two schools of thought on this that would lead throughout the season. The first was that perhaps it was just purely down to driving style. You see, semi-automatic gearboxes had come in and the clutch had been removed and for most drivers, left foot braking was becoming the norm, which is the norm today. However, at the time, for a lot of the drivers who were more experienced, such as Brundle, Hill, Senna, and so on, they had to get used to this because before this, because they had to use the clutch, they would right foot brake like most of us would when driving manual cars. However, remember, Schumacher was brand new to this. So for him, adapting to this left foot braking was much easier than more experienced drivers on the grid. And we've seen throughout Schumacher's career that he would apply a little bit of brakes even when on the throttle to control the car better and give himself a better exit. This driving style would tell us why there was these strange noises as he was cornering. It was him using the brakes and throttle at the same time to move around the corner, as well as the fact that there was a rudimentary blown diffuser on the car that would work well on the throttle and give it a little bit more downforce, which would also add to the reason why this style would suit Schumacher and give the impression of traction control. This was wildly different from what Senna would do, which is blast on the throttle on and off to make sure that the turbo continued to work throughout a corner. Nonetheless, though, Williams and Senna were vocal about thinking there was traction control. And because Schumacher and Benetton were winning, the other teams would be quick to speak out. Except for Ferrari and McLaren. Ferrari because they were still slightly worried about their suspension and McLaren for other reasons. The suspicion, though, jumped through the roof at the French Grand Prix. 
when Schumacher from third on the grid blasted off the line, beating the two Williams drivers off the lights with ease. And the rest of the grid became absolutely convinced that there was either traction control or something akin to launch control on the car. And the FIA would start to dig into this because lots of the other teams were saying that specifically Ferrari, Benetton and McLaren had kept systems on their car that could be accessed at any time. So questions were beginning to be raised, but then an event happened that caused the FIA to go into overdrive when it came to cracking down on any circumvention of the rules and also to implement as many safety upgrades as they could. And that event was, of course, what took place at the Imola Grand Prix. Senna's death caused the FIA and the rest of the teams to go into an emergency mode, essentially, into looking at the cars and making sure rules, especially ones to do with safety and driver aids and whatnot, to be looked at with a fine-tooth comb. This is when they also brought in the skid plank underneath the cars and decided to make full flat floors for the cars as well so that the teams couldn't play around with anything even resembling ground effect. When the FIA started to ask questions of all of the different teams, they asked for the electronic schematics of every single team's cars. All of the teams were quick to respond with a couple of exceptions. Ferrari quickly gave over their information, again, trying to take any skepticism away from their interesting suspension. But Benetton and McLaren weren't so forthcoming. McLaren submitted their documentation after the deadline. And when the FIA's team reviewed this software, they found that McLaren still had an automatic gearbox system on the car. And this is why McLaren decided not to engage heavily in the controversy around Benetton prior to that. McLaren's argument, though, was that the system was never used for downshifts and that it only automatically upshifted for the driver and therefore was not a completely automatic system. And somehow they got away with this. Well, a $100,000 fine for perverting justice. But Benetton continued to hold out saying that due to contracts with Cosworth, they weren't at liberty to hand over this crucial commercial information. And this fight would go on for a while. And in the meantime, there was a little bit more controversy to deal with. At the British Grand Prix, Schumacher lined up alongside Hill, who was on pole. But throughout the formation lap, Schumacher did something which was against the rules. He passed Hill for a good segment of time, eventually giving the position back. He was given a drive-through penalty for this after doing it once again on another formation lap after an incident with Coulthard's car meant that they had to redo the starting procedure. And because he didn't serve that penalty when he came into the pits just having a normal pit stop, black flags were then raised and the driver continued on. The team's excuse? While this was shown on the broadcast, the team itself didn't get this information on the computer and continued to drive as normal. Unfortunately, that excuse didn't work out in the long run and the team for completely disobeying rules and for a variety of other reasons were disqualified from the British Grand Prix. And they would later get a $500,000 fine for doing so. And then at the German Grand Prix, there was a famous event, something which you've probably seen clips of, something that everyone brings up when they talk about bringing refueling back in the dangers. And that was, of course, the pit stop fire for Jos Verstappen. As the fuel was added to Jos Verstappen's Benetton, six kilos of fuel escaped from the hose and was quickly set ablaze, engulfing the pit lane and thankfully not blowing up the canisters beside it, which I believe were air pressure canisters, which could have caused an enormous fire. But this would bring up many more questions after an investigation that would lead the FIA to think something was amiss with the fuel system that Benetton had implemented. And this would harken back to Senna and Williams 
talking about how quickly they were able to fuel at the Brazilian Grand Prix. The FIA continued to try and get access to Benetton's system, and Benetton continued their excuse of, for commercial reasons, not being able to hand it over. But the FIA were able to get around this by essentially saying that it wouldn't be them looking at it, it's LDRA, the Liverpool Data Research and Analytics Company that works for the Secret Service and could work under NDAs anyway. And this meant that eventually Benetton had to give access. However, Benetton refused to do it outside of their facilities, outside of their own testing location, and without them running the test themselves for the LDRA on circuit. And they even cancelled one of these tests the day before it took place and rescheduled. They were playing as many funny games as possible, which is probably what you expect from the team ran by Flavio anyway. But when the LDRA did finally get a look at all of these systems, what they found was a list of options with all of the previous driver aids on it in a list running down to option 10. And then option 11, 12, and 13 were blank. But when they checked further, option 13 was something called launch control. Now, Benetton said that all of these had been disabled, similar to the argument that McLaren made and that they couldn't be enabled by the driver on track. But what the LDRA found was that in fact, not only could these be enabled by the driver on track, but it would take a few minutes and a process. They could be enabled within a few seconds by simply hooking up a laptop in the pit garage. And all of a sudden, the idea of traction control went out the window and the idea that Benetton had been using launch control came into full focus in what became known as the Option 13 scandal, an option that could show up on the steering wheel and give any driver access to its launch control. Charlie Whiting, the FIA technical delegate, quickly submitted all of this information to the World Motorsport Council and a big, big, big investigation and trial would go ahead. Amongst this, there was more problems for Benetton, who had appealed a decision about the British Grand Prix and was allowed to drive at the German Grand Prix, but then was disqualified from the Belgian Grand Prix because of the plank wear to his car. The planks that had come in after the Imola crash of Senna, which are still around today. And Schumacher was unable to drive at the next two Grand Prix. That meant he had been disqualified from Britain, from Belgium, and from two other Grand Prix. And this made the title fight a lot closer than it would have been, with Hill now chasing him down in the Williams, especially given he now had three races to essentially catch up as much as possible. And the World Motorsport Council, before the end of the season, made their decisions on a variety of things throughout the season. One, they crucially found that while option 13 was an issue because it was on the car and could be used, the regulations, because they had come in so late in the final season, didn't talk about having those systems in the car, but instead their use. And while the systems were on the car, just like with McLaren, they couldn't prove that the system had been used. And therefore, like McLaren, they got a $100,000 fine for option 13 for perverting justice. For their antics at the British Grand Prix, as I've already said, they got a $500,000 fine. But possibly the most interesting part of all was the fuel issue with Verstappen. And it turns out that the team had removed a fuel filter from the system, which would allow them to essentially fill up the car faster, but in a very unsafe way. And they had a trick up their sleeve with this one. You see, one of the suppliers of that system had sent a message to another team who had used an argument that the fuel filler could be removed and even though that message never came to Benetton, they found that message afterwards and were able to use this as an excuse for this system. But because of this, Benetton got a very strange response from the FIA. They decided that Benetton, and I quote, had not tried to cheat 
by removing the filter from the refueling rig, but said that the team removed it without authorization from Intertechnik to try and gain an advantage. Yeah, try and work that one out. But the dust had settled, they had gotten away with all of it, and they would end the season even more controversially than the season had gone beforehand. At the final race of the season in Adelaide, the Australian Grand Prix, Mansell qualified on pole, followed by Schumacher, Hill, Hakkinen, Barrichello and Irvine. Schumacher and Hill were one point apart coming into the race, with Schumacher in the favouring position of being one point ahead. So Hill had some work to do. He needed to finish ahead of Schumacher to win. And during the pit stops throughout the race, Schumacher and Hill stayed very close to each other. But coming in to one of the corners, Schumacher lost the car going off the track, came back onto the track, slid across and smashed in to the Williams of Hill. This caused Schumacher's car to go up into the air and into the barrier and be completely out of the race. But fortunately for Schumacher and unfortunately for Hill, his car was also irreparably damaged as the suspension had been bent. And Hill also DNF'd from the race, meaning Schumacher won the 1994 championship by one point. And this is something that you would have assumed Williams would have contested. It was almost obvious to everyone that Schumacher had tried this on purpose. He tried it again in 1997. But Williams had bigger issues on its plate. A lot of its engineers, including team leader Adrian Newey, were up for a manslaughter charge in Italy where the Senna death had taken place. They were still trying to get to the absolute bottom of what happened to that car and explain the issues. They were under heavy scrutiny from everyone outside and Newey and his technical team were doing everything they could to figure out the problems and ensure this never happened again. But this had a huge amount of pressure on the team. The team's technical staff and management were under immense pressure to explain the mechanical failure that led to the crash. And Adrian Newey, who designed Senna's car, expressed that there was no definitive answer as to what caused it, highlighting the complexity around the situation. It was a time of intense grief and scrutiny for Williams. And the entire F1 community as well was feeling this loss. And it initiated a strong push for safety in this sport going forward. All of this meant, especially from Williams' point of view, that contesting Schumacher's title became less and less significant. And unfortunately for Hill, that meant he would have to wait another couple of years before getting a chance at a title. But all of it together made it significantly the most controversial season, at least in my opinion, in F1 history. And the only thing that is more controversial than that season is the subscription.